Uh, thank you, David, for that uh, very kind introduction. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation and for assembling such a nice diverse array of topics. So it's really uh, not just about one matter model. There's uh, all sorts of uh, different kinds of matter represented in this conference. Uh, I think that it's great for all of us who are specialists to hear about what's going on in the other worlds. So uh, thank you for that. Okay, so today is, is uh, mostly about uh, the fluid side of things and mostly it's about fluids in Minkowski space-time. I will not be talking much about the um, uh, coupled Einstein-Euler problem um, I will, at the end, I'll highlight that as essentially an open problem. But um, <clears throat> before uh, I talk about open problems, I have to tell you about the kinds of problems I'm thinking about. Okay, so before we talk about relativistic Euler Minkowski space, I want to make a few comments on the non-relativistic compressible Euler equations. So there have been some uh, uh, recent results on uh, low regularity local well posedness. So uh, this is a uh, joint work I did with some collaborators. And then uh, later, or not much later, uh, Chan Wang uh, actually sharpened what we did. And I'll, I'll say more about that in a bit. And there's also been um, some very results on shock waves, formation of shock waves starting from smooth initial conditions. Um, so this is uh, in the non-relativistic case, this is uh, work I did with Jonathan Luke a few years back. And uh, what made the work novel compared to Christodoulou's breakthrough was we were able to understand vorticity, the presence of vorticity uh, in the context of shock formation. And there's also a different approach that's uh, much more recent to understanding uh, the formation of shocks with um, vorticity and entropy. And um, <coughs> I'll say a little bit more about the differences between the two approaches in a few slides. Okay, so <coughs> proofs, at least, of uh, low regularity results and the shock formation results I did with Jonathan, they are not through a standard first order formulation of the uh, uh, non-relativistic Euler equations. They are through a different formulation that exhibits some truly remarkable properties, um, both at the level of uh, the null structure in the equations and at the level of um, the differentiability pro properties of the different kinds of solutions. Okay, so basically, Entropy of vorticity. And the main message I have for you today is that the relativistic Euler equations enjoy a similar remarkable formulation. And this is a joint work with Disconti uh, going back to late 2019. Okay, so um, the relativistic Euler equations actually, um, the formulation is, is a bit more complicated compared to the non relativistic case. So, on the one hand, the relativistic Euler equations are inherently more uh, geometric in the way that they're typically formulated. On the other hand, um, they're more complicated than the non-relativistic Euler equations in the sense that the geometry of non-relativistic Euler is conformally flat. And, um, let me delay further discussion of what I mean by that until later in the talk. Whereas in the non-relativistic case, there is no conformal flatness so that so the basic the fundamental metric that governs the dynamics is a bit more complicated in the non-relativistic case. And so there are actually some new cancellations and structures one needs to observe in order to see that the relativistic Euler, Euler equations enjoy these good structures. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this talk at a very high level because I know there are lots of non-fluid experts and I'm not gonna talk a lot about estimates or hard results. I'm gonna talk a lot about structure of the equations and I'm gonna to try to give you some big picture of uh, why people like me, Jonathan and Marcelo are, are interested in this way of thinking about fluid. Okay. And once you have um, such a formulation exhibiting these structures, which I admittedly haven't told you about yet. So one uh, basic consequence is that it's expected that the non-relativistic results should carry over. So basically low regularity will pose in this, the formation, formation of shots. Because you have the good structures available in the equations, the expectation is that you know, the, the, the proofs should essentially carry over with some modifications. More broadly, once you have this kind of formulation, this way of thinking about fluids, what it does for you is it unlocks the geometric vector field method. So historically, the, the geometric uh, vector field method for fluids has most successfully been applied in the irrotational case when everything reduces to the study of a wave equation. Whereas when, once you have vorticity and entropy present, there's a coupling between the wave phenomena 
and the transport phenomena. And a priori, it's not so easy to use the, the vector field techniques on the, that you are familiar with on the wave side. It's not so easy to use them to study the transport part. But thanks to the new formulation, in fact, you can use basically all of the techniques that were developed in the context of wave equations. You basically can use those techniques to study the full Euler system featuring both wave and transport phenomena. And let me also highlight a long-term goal. So um, basically one day, I hope that we're able to understand the global structure of piecewise smooth solutions with shock waves. And okay, maybe not for all data, that's asking too much, but maybe in a perturbative regime. You know, maybe one can perturb around some semi-explicit solutions and understand something about the global structure of fluids uh, that have shocks inside of them and that continue to form shocks as the evolution progresses. Okay, so that goal at the moment is far away, but that is a big motivating factor um, behind what we're doing. Okay, so before I talk about uh, relativistic Euler, I, I wanna talk about a simple model problem. Well, it looks simple anyway. So it's very rich. It's simply a geometric wave equation, box psi is zero, where psi is the scalar function. And what is G? It's a Lorentzian metric where I'm assuming that there's some standard coordinate system uh, let's say the rectangular coordinates or Cartesian coordinates where the uh, metric component functions G alpha beta are given prescribed functions of psi that are sufficiently smooth. So um, as we'll see in a little bit, um, uh, relativistic Euler has something to do with this kind of equation. Okay, and here I wanna emphasize for those of you who don't work in geometric wave equations that box means covariant box. So if you write it out in your favorite coordinate system, it looks like this, okay? So, you know, it's, it's a divergence uh, up to this factor. It's a divergence form wave operator. So that the divergence form structure is really important, okay? Really important. Now, what happens if you differentiate out this expression? You let, for example, you let the alpha, the d alpha derivative fall on g inverse. Then except, uh, except in the case of some uh, miracle assumptions on the metric G itself, it's, it's, uh, if you make some miraculous assumptions on the G alpha beta components, then this expression might have good structure. But generally, when you differentiate it out, it will lack good null structure. So basically when D alpha falls on G inverse, you'll get like a D psi times D psi term. And that term has no good structure. Uh, for example, in the case of irrotational fluid mechanics, that term has no good structure. And as a consequence, it turns out that uh, singularities can form in the solutions, even when the initial conditions are small and smooth. So in particular, uh, shocks can form. Okay. And let me not at the moment give a full description of what I mean by shock, but the, let me instead give a very crude description mean by shock. What I mean by shock is that the derivatives of psi can blow up, whereas psi itself remains bounded. Okay, so it's a, on the scale of singularities, it's relatively mild. Okay, so let me talk about some results for the model problem before I jump into uh, uh, what's going on in uh, relativistic fluids. So there was a big breakthrough by Chris Adulu in 2007. This was his proof of uh, shock formation for, uh, in the small data regime for irritational compressible fluids. And actually in his first book, he treated the case of relativistic Euler for essentially every equation of state except one that corresponds to the um, uh, to the uh, minimal time uh, to the minimal surface equation Lorentzian geometry, and um, his proof basically relied on showing that the relativistic Euler equations can be treated just like this model problem. So when the data are irrotational, Chris Adulu's proof was basically you know study of this kind of model equation for the specific wave equations that come from irrotational fluid mechanics. Okay, so then I was a PhD student. I was uh, very inspired by this uh, thousand page book. And I was interested in to what extent did it depend on uh, the structure of uh, the equations of fluid mechanics. And it turns out that it essentially doesn't depend on the structure of the equations of fluid mechanics. So, so I wrote a book 
And basically the content of the book is that uh, Chris Sadulu's blow up results for the wave equations of irrotational fluid mechanics hold essentially for all model scalar wave equations, except for the one special one that satisfies something like a null condition. And there's been a lot of uh, work uh, in the wake of Chris Adulu's, um breakthrough. Um, uh, Miao and Yu have investigated other kinds of wave equations and other solution regimes. And um, I've take, taken a look at other uh, kinds of solution regimes. By other regimes, I mean other kinds of initial data that are not strictly speaking uh, small. So for example, in this work with uh, Holzogel, Luke, and Wong, we looked at perturbations of plane symmetric solutions where plane symmetric solutions have infinite energy if you interpret them as solutions in the, uh, both the full space time. Okay, so not only was Chris Adulu's result itself important, but sort of the ideas he introduced were completely uh, fundamental and they keep bearing fruit over and over. Okay, and <clears throat> let me uh, switch gears for one second and talk about uh, local well posedness results for the model equation. So this is in, if you want, three space. Below the classical uh, threshold five halves plus where uh, local well posedness uh, is easily established by Sobolev embedding and energy estimates. So to go below this threshold, you need something different. And there have been a lot of results on uh, going below this exponent. Um, Certainly among the earliest important results were the kleinerman rodniansky results on H2 plus epsilon local well posedness for the Einstein vacuum equations, which are um, you know, at their core for purposes of local well posedness, they're not that different than the model of problem. The, you know, Einstein vacuum is not that different than the for purposes of local well posedness. And um, Smith Sitaru uh, proved the same result for general quasi-linear wave equations, not going beyond Einstein vacuum. And then there's an um, important result of Chen Wang. Um, and she ha had a different uh, proof of the smith tataru result, which is a lot more geometric and it's a, it's a lot more flexible. Okay, it is, it's in the spirit of how people working in relativity uh, think about waves. Okay, so here are two classes of results for the Well, there's actually a strong unifying theme between the two uh, kinds of works. Both of these works fundamentally rely on the construction of iconal functions. So in relativity, this is called optical function, but in, uh, you know, more broadly, we call it iconal function. And again, both, both of these kinds of results fundamentally rely on nonlinear geometric optics by virtue of constructing uh, an iconal function. And so here I want to emphasize that this iconal function U, where the coefficients couple back to the, the actual PDE that you care about. So in the case of fluids, you know, this metric G depends on the fluid. And so obviously there's a coupling between the fluid and the um, iconal function through the principal coefficients. And, um, you know, it's been understood since the Chris Adulu Kleinerman proof of stability Minkowski space time that it's a very good idea to study wave equations uh, through foliations that are to an iconal function. And uh, now we understand that it's a good idea to do this more general uh, wave equations. And now we understand that it's still a good idea to do this in uh, the context of uh, fluid mechanics with vorticity and entropy. Okay, so um, uh, a big message that I have for you is that the way I've been thinking about fluids with Jonathan Luke and Marcella Disconzi enables you to sharply understand the behavior of iconal functions in the context of fluid mechanics. Okay, so in a, later on in the talk, I'll try to make that a bit more explicit. Okay, <clears throat> so here's uh, another big idea for you. For some applications, okay, not all applications, but especially ones involving iconal functions. It turns out that at least in some regimes that we understand, one can treat the relativistic Euler equations as perturbations of the model problem. Okay, really, you know, this model problem has a lot of the interesting dynamics hiding in it. And then um, the goal becomes to understand to what extent can you treat the rest of relativistic Euler as a perturbation of this model problem. Okay. So <clears throat> before I get into the nitty gritty of relativistic Euler, let me give you some schematic representation 
of uh, the wave part of relativistic Euler. So loosely speaking, what one is able to do is to split the relativistic Euler equations up into a wave part and a transport part. And later I'll talk about the transport part. Here I'm just talking about the wave part. Okay, so I'll tell you exactly what I mean by wave part later in the talk. So there's a wave part, psi, and it's, it's not a scalar in the case of uh, relativistic Euler. It's, a, it's an array of solution variables. But in any case, it solves a covariant wave equation where there's a Lorentz metric G. It's called the acoustical metric. It's, it's, even, if, even if you're talking about fluids in Minkowski spacetime, it's important to appreciate that this acoustical metric is not the Minkowski metric. It's the metric of the fluid. Okay, it's, it's a quasi-linear metric depending on the fluid. And uh, if you have vorticity and entropy floating around in spacetime, then the right-hand side is no longer zero. You have uh, terms that depend on the vorticity and depend, terms that depend on the entropy. And it actually turns out that it depends on the, the terms are of the form curl of the vorticity and the divergence of the gradient of the entropy. And so this is one derivative of the vorticity and two derivatives of the entropy. And actually there's a lot of structure in these terms that I'm not displaying right now. And it turns out that their precise structure matters for applications. So here I'm just being very schematic. And then there's another kind of term that you have on the right-hand side, which is uh, a bit more familiar and easier to handle. And these are G null forms. What do I mean by that? I'll tell you in one second. Um, but the big idea certainly is to show that these terms on the right-hand side are perturbative at least in some solution regimes. So uh, right now it's understood that these terms can be viewed as perturbative from the point of view of uh, local well posedness at low regularity and from the point of view of understanding the formation of shocks. Okay, and again, the precise nonlinear structure of these terms, which I'm not displaying here is really important. Okay, so what do I mean by G null form? So I essentially mean a null form that is null where the notion of null is adapt adapted to the actual metric in the principle corresponding to the principal terms in the equations. So this does not mean null relative to the Minkowski metric. Okay, so in for those of you familiar with small data global existence problems, um, you're probably used to thinking of cubic and fourth order terms as harmless, at least. Um, it turns out that in the study of shock waves, you cannot think that way. You cannot Taylor expand. You cannot um, uh, you cannot throw away cubic terms because cubic terms. You know, if, if the cubic term is blowing up, then even if it's cubically small initially, you know, later when the singularity forms, it might be the dominant term. Okay, so that means when you're doing decompositions, when you're looking for good structures, it has to be adapted exactly with no margin of error whatsoever to the actual geometry of the problem. Okay exactly to the geometry of the problem. So for example, by G null form, I might mean a quadratic term that looks like this. And um, now what about these, uh, these curl of vorticity and double derivative of entropy terms? Well, as I'll show you in the coming slides, there's the potential for derivative loss tied to these two terms. If you formally count derivatives, it sort of looks very problematic that you're putting these terms on the right-hand side. Um, nonetheless, it's possible to gain one derivative compared to standard estimates on both of these terms. And that essentially enables you to put them on the right-hand side and think of them as source terms that drive the evolution of waves. And uh, how do you do this? Uh, well, this is through uh, searching for needles and haystacks. And uh, what we've been able to find in the non-relativistic case with uh, Luke and then in the relativistic case with Visconti is that there's these terms satisfy a div curl transport system. So something like a Hodge system with a transport element to it that enables you to gain a derivative. And moreover, there's good null structure associated to these systems. So basically everything good happens. You gain a derivative enabling you to put these on, terms on the right-hand side of the wave equation and uh, you see good, good null structure, not only in the wave equations, but in these div curl transport systems. So in basically every good miracle you could hope for happens. Now, I don't have a great philosophical reason for why this uh, should be true. You know, you know, when, we, when I was first working on these things with Jonathan, we were just looking, right? You know, secretly, I'm, I'm certain that at the end of the day, the reason that these things are available is because 
the non-relativistic Euler equations and the relativistic Euler equations are both Euler-Lagrange equations. They derive from a Lagrangian. You can formulate the equations in a, or you can formulate the Euler-Lagrange equations in a, essentially in an invariant language. And anytime you have a, in, you know, a, a diffeomorphic and diffeomorphism invariant theory, it sort of forbids certain combinations of terms from being there. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm speaking very broadly and not rigorously at all, but at the end of the day, I believe that the reason that these structures are available is because of uh, the Euler-Lagrange structure of the equations. Okay. So before, again, before I really jump into the um, relativistic Euler equations, let me show you some motivating pictures. So these are pictures of things that have been understood um, in the irrotational case when there's no vorticity and uh, the entropy is constant or, or vanishing. So this is uh, essentially what happened in um, uh, Chris Adulu's, uh monograph from 2007. This is the picture of the formation of a shock singularity in an initially smooth irrotational solution. So this is basically the study of a scalar wave equation where the scalar function is the potential function for the fluids. And these uh, collapse of these gray lines represents the intersection of characteristics where each level set of, or each characteristic is a, is a level set for an iconal function. And what I want you to appreciate is that he gave the complete description of the maximal development of the initial data, at least for an open set of solutions that satisfies some convexity assumptions. I don't really wanna get into those details right now. And uh, this is a cross section of the picture. So this, this tip down here, for example, represents something like a first singularity. You know, in reality, it's not a point. If you expand this picture, it ends up being something like a, uh, or at least in the non-degenerate case, this tip ends up being something like a co-dimension two sub-manifold of space-time. I want you to appreciate that the, the maximal development, its boundary has different pieces. Okay, so there's the singular part, which is called B in this picture, where something actually blows up. And there is the regular, these uh, singular points down here, or the singular sub-manifolds, where the solution remains regular, no formation of any singularity. There's no formation of singularity along the Cauchy horizon, except down here at the tip. Okay, and this is the largest possible uh, space-time region where the solution is, where the classical solution is uniquely determined. So this was the picture in the irrotational case. And the techniques that I've been developing with uh, with Jonathan and Marcelo are towards, and we haven't quite achieved this yet, but they're towards um, uh, establishing this picture in the presence of vorticity and entropy. So I also wanna highlight that the, um, the first person, essentially the first person to understand the behavior of the solution up to the first singular point was uh, Serge Alinac. So in, in the late 1990s, he had some really important results uh, on uh, blow up for wave equation, quasi-linear wave equations. And it actually included as a special case, irrotational fluid mechanics. And it started, his results didn't give this uh, full picture here, but they did enable him to understand the behavior of the solution up to the first singularity. Okay. And uh, moreover, so this is where the, the results of uh, Buckmaster, Scholar, and V. Cole that I mentioned earlier, those results also allow you to understand the behavior of the solution up to, up to the first singularity whenever it's isolated. And um, uh, of course, the difference between the Alinac work and the Buckmaster et al. work is that the, the latter allowed for vorticity and entropy. Okay, but really, uh, I, you, if you really want to understand the global behavior of a fluid, um, you want to understand this picture and how it emerges. Okay, and I'll clarify why that is on the next slide. Okay, so here's a more, uh, it's, okay, it's a cruder drawing, but it's, it's, it's showing you the, um, the, the, a bit better, the geometry. So this is the same picture, except I've expanded the singular point into a, you know, a, a sub-manifold, like I told you it is, at least you know, under certain gen genericity assumptions on the initial data, um, you know, this is the picture. And there's a, new, there's a new ingredient in this picture. This is the shock hypersurface. So let me talk a little bit more about this picture. 
Okay, so this is the same Cauchy horizon from uh, before that emanates from this first, uh, let me call it a first singularity. This is the past boundary of B. This is a, ends up being a space-like submanifold where the notion of space-like is measured uh, relative to the actual metric in the problem, the, you know, the, the Lorentzian metric B, uh, not the Minkowski metric. And this B is the same singular boundary from the other, where uh, blow up occurs in the maximal de smooth development of the data. Okay, but something funny happens in fluid mechanics. Something really funny happens. Um, if you impose the weak formulation of, uh, of the flow, so what do I mean by weak formulation? Let me just say that uh, you can think of the fluid equations as divergence. You can formulate them as first order divergence form equations. And then essentially it's the usual notion of weak solution where you integrate by parts and put the derivative on a test function. Okay. If you think of the, um, uh, the fluid equations in their weak form, then down here in the smooth, smooth regime, the notion of weak solution and classical solution completely coincide. They're okay. Of course, this is something that you want out of your theory. However, as soon as the first singularity develops, as represented in this picture by this uh, red line, this past boundary would be, as soon as the first singularity develops, if you impose the weak formulation of the flow in a vicinity of this red line, it actually introduces a new speed in the problem. And the speed is supersonic. You know, it's 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 faster than you know it's uh, faster than the speed of sound. It's basically you want to think of it as space-like. And uh, so this this hypersurface K is called the shock hypersurface. And at the end of the day, if you can make this picture rigorous, it is the it is the surface across which the fluid will jump. So, so, so there will be a jump in the uh, density and velocity across this uh, hypersurface. If you can, if you can uh, in fact, rigorously construct the weak solution, you will see a jump. Okay. And you notice that this shock hypersurface sticks out into the maximal classical development. So uh, what happens is, or at least <clears throat> I can tell you what happens in the, well, let's, I'll call it, loosely the irrotational case, but really it uh, should be thought of as slightly. So what I'm talking about is Chris Sedulu's, uh more recent work from 2019 in which he saw, solved the restricted shock development problem. So <clears throat> in, in that monograph, he made this picture rigorous for the compressible Euler equations, both relativistic and non-relativistic, except he chose to ignore the jump in entropy and vorticity across the shock hypersurface. So essentially the, the laws of ther thermodynamics uh, sort of force you to consider solutions where the entropy should jump to across, jump to the, in the positive direction as you head across the surface. And uh, Chris Adulu forced those jumps to be equal to zero. He set them, he manually put them equal to zero and so this, and he looked at a weak formulation of the equations where he forced those things to be zero. And it, it turns out that that formulation of the equations does not exactly coincide with the usual weak notion of a, a solution to the Euler equations. So he actually solved, if you want, he's, he made this picture precise for a slightly different system of equations that is meant to emulate what happens uh, in the case of the Euler equations with no vorticity and no entropy. Okay. Jared, Jared, yes. can, I, yes. can I just ask to, to clarify? Yeah. So, so yeah, please. Yeah. The, the hypersurface B is, is, is space like with respect to the acoustical metric. That's, that's in, right. In the relativistic case, it is, it is time like with respect to the Minkowski metric? Um, it should be, uh, let's see. So, let me think about that. So, I, I, I'm, I have to think for one sec. It should be, so, okay. So, let me, maybe it's, I'll clarify like this. So there's a there's a wicked degeneracy that occurs in this problem, and um, so down here at the red line, everything is null. With the so the, this this yellow hypersurface K is null with respect to the acoustical metric, 
And it's also tangent to the uh, singular boundary B, which is, uh, which is null. Down here, it's null. And then it quickly turns space-like. So that means it would be time. I think it would be time-like with respect to the uh, Minkowski metric because the, the fluid sound cones sit inside of the Minkowski light cones. So there's no superluminal uh, propagation. That's right. There's no superluminal. That's right. That's right. No superluminal. It's and this is true also in, in, let's say, so in the solutions that uh, Christodoulou constructs, which, okay, are not solutions of the actual Euler incorporating the laws of thermodynamics, but they're solutions of whatever they are. This, this is also, this is again the case that you do not have superluminal. Yeah, so it's, a, it's sort of like a fundamental equation invariant feature of the problem that at the first singularity, the, uh, the, 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 both of these surfaces will be null with respect to the true geometry of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sure, my pleasure. Okay, so yeah, so um, wicked degeneracy where this uh, shock hypersurface that one wants to construct is null with respect to the acoustical metric down here along the red line. And the same is true of the singular boundary, it's null. And then uh, they diverge, you know, as uh, you know, the uh, as, as the evolution progresses, this uh, hypersurface K turns uh, space like uh, faster than the uh, singular boundary turns space-like. Okay, so uh, again, this is the picture that one wants to establish for the uh, non-relativistic Euler equations with vorticity and entropy. And of course, one would also like to establish um, for the relativistic Euler equations. But right now, the state of the art is that Chris Adulu has done it um, only for the restricted shock development problem. Now, I believe he's actually working on the full problem right now. And, you know, there's a chance that any day the, you know, bomb falls out of the sky and, you know, we can all start. Uh, I'm sure I'll be made an offer I can't refuse, which is to referee that uh, work. <laughs> um, but for now, indeed, the state of the art is that um, this picture has not been made fully rigorous except for the uh, uh, restricted shock development problem. And in fact, there is, uh, there are some non-degeneracy non assumptions that have been made along the singular boundary. Um, uh, but at least those conditions are satisfied for open sets of initial data. Okay. And then let me just give you a glimpse into the, to the future, at least what I hope is the future one day, certainly within our, um, uh, within our academic lifetime. Um, you know, this is a hyperbolic problem with finite speed of propagation. So you might have multiple singularities forming in different regions of space. And then let's say from one singularity, a Cauchy horizon pops out. And from another singularity, a shock hypersurface pops out. At some point, those two will interact. They will smash into each other. And you would like to understand how to weakly evolve to the future of this picture. And that will involve all sorts of um, new phenomena, presumably. Okay. And I mean, nothing is really rigorously understood at the moment. And uh, the idea is that the way that Jonathan and I and Marcelo have been thinking about uh, the fluid equations is we believe that uh, this, the setup will be helpful for us for understanding these kinds of things. Okay. So <clears throat> let me now finally turn to the uh, equations that I promised you I'd talk about. This is the relativistic Euler equations. So they're often written in the first order uh, quasi-linear hyperbolic form like this. And what, what is this uh, array of unknowns? Well, there's the enthalpy, that's capital H, and I prefer to take the log. It makes the equations a little simple, simpler, so that's little h. Then there's the four velocity components, and then there's the entropy scalar, little s. Okay, so these are the fundamental unknowns in the system, or at least you can choose them to be the fundamental unknowns. And uh, it's a quasi-linear hyperbolic system. And there is secretly hiding in the equations, the Minkowski metric, and uh, which I call, I'm calling eta here. And the four velocity is uh, unit length by that metric. And to close the equations, you need an equation of state. So, you know, secretly the pressure appears in the problem. And um, one way to close the system is to prescribe the pressure as a function of the density and uh, the entropy. Okay, do that. Um, there's the fundamental quantity uh, C, the speed of sound, which is the, the root of uh, dpd rho. And um, uh, if you want to look at a wave problem, you have to assume this is positive. If the speed of sound goes to zero, then the equations become very degenerate and uh, 
you know, you need, you need different techniques to understand the flow. And uh, it's fair to say that not much is known. So I'm going to assume that the speed of sound is positive. And there are two propagation phenomena in, in the Euler flow. There's sound waves and, and the transporting of vorticity and entropy. And if it's not clear from this formulation how the two things interact or emerge. You can't see their coupling. And um, I do want to point out that the variable S is, uh, is uh, crucial for studying um, solutions with shocks. Let me just give you one example of what I mean by that. Um, what is expected, or I mean, what, what the laws of thermodynamics dictate is that even if the entropy is initially everywhere zero and the solution begins uh, start rotational, then after the shock, the entropy will jump to the future and the solution will develop. So basically, if you really wanna understand the full picture of uh, solutions with shocks, you should include the entropy variable. Okay, so let me, uh, for those of you who are not uh, fluid people, let me quickly review some basics of relativistic fluid flow. So there's the four velocity, which is a, a Minkowski time-like vector field, feature directed. And then here's the metric G. Okay, this is the fundamental metric that drives the propagation of sound waves in relativistic Euler flow. And it depends on the speed of sound through this term C right here. And it depends on the Minkowski metric and it depends on the four velocity. And remember the speed of sound depends on the, uh, the energy density and the, um, and the entropy or equivalently the enthalpy, logarithmic enthalpy little h and the entropy. So basically all fluid variables are featured in the, um, in the acoustical metric. You know, it depends on all of the unknowns. And I also wanna point out that the four velocity, not only is it time-like relative to the Minkowski metric, it's time-like relative to the actual metric in the problem. So if you compute the length of uh, the four velocity with respect to this metric, it's also, you know, it's, it's also unit length. And so in particular, what it means is no matter which null hypersurface you look at, no matter which one you look at, this four velocity will still be transversal to it. It can't be tangent because it's time-like. And so it's a really simple and basic fact, but it ends up being uh, really important for the uh, analysis of the flow. So the, the four velocity is always time-like. Really, uh, you know, you can, if you have some null hypersurface that is null with respect to the, um, and you have a transport equation from the point where the transport direction is U itself, then the variable that solves the transport equation, you can, you can uh, treat the null hypersurface almost as if it were like a space-like hypersurface. You know, once you have U being, transversal to the null hypersurfaces, then there's no, from the point of view of the transport operator, there's no fundamental difference between the null hypersurface and the space-like hypersurface. You know, what really matters for transport operators is transversality. Okay. And <clears throat> so it turns out that to tell you about all of these structures, uh, I need to introduce more variables. Some of these variables that I'm gonna introduce are very uh, standard, okay. Um, so let me talk about the, if you're given some uh, one form big V, you can talk about its U orthogonal vorticity. So this is essentially like a vorticity operator, but if you contract against U itself, you get zero because of the anti-symmetry of the epsilon symbol and the fact that you know U is sitting in the second slot here. So this is a, a, a kind of vorticity. And then let me talk about the vorticity vector field itself, which is this uh, omega looking symbol. This is the vorticity, as defined above, of the uh, enthalpy current, where the enthalpy current is by definition the product of the four velocity and the enthalpy capital H. So, you know, it looks like this. And then finally, let me introduce the en entropy gradient one form. It's convenient to, you know, take the gradient of the uh, little s and call it big S and to work with this variable. Okay, so these are all standard variables in the study of relativistic fluid flow. Now the next pair of variables I'm gonna introduce are not so standard. So they have a couple of exciting properties. They, they exhibit improved regularity and they solve PDEs with good null structure where null is uh, to be understood with respect to G. So here they are, they're a mess. I don't expect you to take away much from, uh, this the, from the details of these equations. Um, these variables, uh, Marcelo and I found them by basically playing with the equations and uh, looking for um, 
uh, combinations of terms that solve good PDEs. So how can you think about them? Well, C is kind of like the curl of the, of the vorticity. So it's like a double curl. So it's like the curl of the curl with a bunch of lower order correction terms. And D is kind of like the divergence of the entropy gradient. So it's like, you can think of this as the Minkowski box of little s plus some lower order terms. And again, I am not, I'm not familiar with any physical interpretation of these variables. I don't know of any, I've never seen them in any physics publication. We found them by playing with the equations. And um, these, uh, these variables, theta, theta is the temperature and n is the number density. In principle, given an equation of state, all of these um, quantities appearing on the screen are determined by the equation of state. So everything can be thought of as a function of H and S uh, at the end of the day. Okay. So these are the, these modified variables. And um, so one, made it, one motivation for looking for these uh, monsters is that uh, we first found them in the non-relativistic case. Okay, so I don't think I would have had the um, you know, gusto to do these calculations in the relativistic case if I hadn't seen them uh, done in a simpler form in the non-relativistic case. Okay, and finally, let me again just emphasize what is a null form relative to G. Well, there's the famous anti-symmetric null forms, which actually have nothing to do with the uh, geometry, but then there's the, uh, there's the other null form that does depend explicitly on, on the uh, acoustical metric. Okay, so this is what I mean by null form relative to G. And let me just highlight again that the purpose of the new formulation, which I'm gonna show very soon, it, it simply allows you to apply the geometric techniques for mathematical relativity and nonlinear wave equations. It allows you to take those techniques and, and import them into the study of relativistic fluid flow. And of course, the big new issue is you have to deal with the interaction of wave and transport phenomena. If you study pure gravity problems, there's only gravitational waves, but if you add a fluid, then you have to study gravitational waves, fluid waves, and the uh, fluid uh, transport phenomena. And um, the interaction is very interesting. The interaction between the, even in just the pure fluid problem, the interaction between wave and transport phenomena is, is very rich. And I'll try to give you some indication of that in the next slide. One can say there are multiple characteristic speeds. So by this, I simply mean that there's the sound waves and the speed of sound, and then there's also the transport phenomena, which are, you know, it's transverse to the sound waves. Okay, so finally, I'll start to display the equations. And um, so this is my work with uh, Marcelo. And um, I'm not gonna display them in full detail because uh, it's a mess, and I think it would distract you from the qualitative features, which are at the end, you know, the most interesting part. Okay, so, Let's call psi the array, the array of unknowns. And let's, let me just loosely refer to those as the wave variables. If you calculate box of psi, where G is the acoustical metric that I showed uh, back at the beginning, then on the right-hand side, you get three kinds of source terms. You get null forms, and then you get the, the, um, the C variable, the modified C variable, the double curl, and the modified D variable, the double divergence. So those are the kinds of source terms. And then the vorticity omega satisfies the transport equation. And the entropy gradient also satisfies the transport equation. Okay, so uh, this is great. Um, however, counting derivatives. If you count derivatives and you express those modified variables C and D in terms of psi, I mean, you can do that. You can you know, write them out in terms of the fundamental unknowns. You will see that they depend on two derivatives of psi. So formally, this first equation says that two derivatives of psi on the left equals uh, two derivatives of psi on the right. And of course, you can never treat a problem like this unless there's some other special structure, right? There's the regularity theory will never work. Those terms seem to belong on the left. Um, but it turns out that these terms are actually better. They satisfy independent good equations. And uh, here they are. So this is the div curl system for the vorticity omega. And this is a div, div curl system for the entropy gradient capital S. So if you look at the um, uh, vorticity equation, you have, an, you have an expression for the space-time divergence of the vorticity. It's given to you. And then you have a transport equation for the curl of omega, where the source terms in the transport equation are null forms or uh, terms that depend uh, linearly on these uh, new modified fluid variables. Okay, so the, you know, there's a lot of special structure hiding in this. 
And the variable that capital D satisfies a similar system, but somehow the role of uh, divergence and curl are switched. Where here the divergence is dynamic and the curl is not. Okay. And so uh, if you count derivatives now, um, through Hodge estimates, you, you can say that, okay, if I can control uh, the divergence of omega and the curl of omega, then I should be able to control one derivative of omega just through uh, elliptic estimates, just formally counting derivatives. And uh, indeed, that, that's, that's what one can show, you, that you can control these variables at a consistent regularity level. So you can control one derivative of omega, and that means you can control this variable C, and that means indeed, you're, from the point of view of regularity, you're allowed to put it on the right-hand side of the equations. Okay. It doesn't mean that you should always put it on the right-hand side of the equations for all applications. It means that you, you'll do this. Um, for example, in the study of the formation of shocks, you know, I, it's a good idea to put this on the right-hand side of the equation. Okay. For the weak evolution, it's maybe a bit less clear what one should do, but okay. Um, <clears throat> so let me say something about the, the difference between um, uh, the non-relativistic case and the relativistic case. Just to highlight one way, one among several, in which the geometry is a bit more interesting in the um, relativistic case. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, one thing I want to highlight then is that these are space-time div curl transport systems. This is space-time. This is space-time divergence, and this is some kind of four-dimensional u-orthogonal curl. But in applications, um, you, you, wanna, you want div curl estimates along spaces like hypersurfaces. Let's say hypersurfaces of constant uh, Minkowski rectangular time. It's not enough to have space-time div curl systems. Um, you need div curl systems along space like hypersurfaces, which you have in the non-relativistic case. If you look at the non-relativistic case, you don't have a space-time div curl transport system. You have a spatial div curl transport system. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's a difference. So what can one do if one wants estimates on space like hypersurfaces? Um, so what you can do is you can consider the transport equation for the vorticity and you can consider the fact that the contracting the vorticity against the four velocity gives you zero, but basically by definition of vorticity, it's orthogonal to the four velocity. And so if you take a derivative of this, this tells you that if you have one derivative of the vorticity and it's contracted against the four velocity, well, that's from the point of view of regularity, just as good as one derivative of the four velocity. Okay, so these simple observations allow you to take the, uh, the, um, the gradient of the vorticity and decompose it into two kinds of pieces. The, the pieces that are in the direction of U in the sense of uh, differentiation or contraction and the uh, orthogonal parts, okay? And what that enables you to do is to excise the time-like part of the gradient of omega. You can cut it out. You can basically remove all the U components. And what remains is basically the, it gives you a spatial div curl transport system. Okay, so this is, you know, if you want, one of the differences between the relativistic and the non-relativistic flow is that um, to get estimates on space like hypersurfaces, you always need to be factoring out the behavior of, you need to take into account the U direction in a way that you don't have to in the non-relativistic case. And you can do all of these things in such a way that preserves the good null structure. Okay, so, you know, it, indeed, it takes some effort to, to see these uh, decompositions, to see them at the level where you see the good null structure, but, um, you know, indeed, it, it can be done. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, similar, similar remarks hold for the entropy gradient. Here, I was just talking about the vorticity, but you can do something similar for the entropy gradient. Okay, so if you want, this is the basic uh, framework that enables you to control the fluid. Um, thinking of it as a wave transport div curl system. Okay, so <clears throat> I've already mentioned um, some potential applications that stem from this way of thinking about fluids, uh, but let me just revisit them and highlight them in a little more detail. Um, <clears throat> certainly I believe that it should be possible to understand stable shock formation without symmetry, uh, like Chris Adu did in the irritational case, or like I did with Jonathan in the non-relativistic case. Structure will be very important there. There's no doubt. Um, 
uh, there's a PhD student at Vanderbilt who's looking at um, low regularity uh, sound waves for uh, uh, relativistic Euler, this uh, low regularity well posedness. And uh, there are some new ideas are needed because the div curl support systems are no longer constant coefficient. They're variable coefficient. So you need some new analysis to handle that. But um, so that, that should be a doable problem. And for that, for the for local well posedness, you don't really need the null structure. Um, <clears throat> now, ideally, one would like to uh, solve the shock development problem for relativistic Euler. And uh, it, it's clear that one would need some new ideas beyond uh, what I've presented in terms of the structure of the equations. But um, it's certainly a problem that, you know, in principle, uh, there are some ideas that can be um, applied and, uh, you know, like I said, you know, Chris Adulu might solve this any day now. And certainly wh whatever the solution is, the null structure of the problem will be very important, very, very important. And I already highlighted earlier that one day we hope to understand the long-term dynamics of solutions with shocks. Okay. And this is completely open away from symmetry. There's uh, nothing. Okay. Um, David, what's the situation of time? So I'm looking at the clock at 10 or... My yeah, so we have uh, eight minutes, including the time for questions. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to jump all the way to the looking forward part of the talk. Um, that way I can leave some time for questions. And um, <clears throat> so I, I will highlight what has not been understood. Yet. One big issue, especially for this audience, of course, is uh, what happens with Einstein Euler. You know, to what extent, if any, do the good structures that I've been talking about survive when you couple to the Einstein equations? If you were to simply replace the Minkowski metric with your favorite C infinity uh, Lorentzian metric, I am, I am certain that um, you know, the good structures would be available for the Euler equations on that fixed background, for sure. I'm, I'm confident that would be true. However, when you go to understand the coupled problem, you know, Euler coupled to Einstein, uh, you'll have to grapple with the different regularity properties of the diff different solution variables. So for example, you know, is the metric sufficiently differentiable so that I can implement this uh, framework? Are there good null structures? Can I do estimates for the metric along fluid sound cones? Those kinds of questions will be very important. And my feeling is that um, if, if there's an affirmative answer, then it will only be because someone discovers some interesting new structures. And I, ha I haven't really worked on this problem. I haven't had time to work on this problem. So I don't really have any insights to offer on to what extent those structures will survive or not. But it's certainly an interesting open problem. I mean, at the end of the day, you wanna understand shock waves in cosmology. And uh, so you'll have to grapple with this problem at some point. Okay, I should say, let me just say in passing that I. <laughs> If, if it turned out that the, the speed of sound were super luminal, then there are techniques available that would enable you to understand uh, shock formation for the coupled problem. So it turns out it's a lot harder to understand the formation of a shock in a multi-speed problem when the, when the shock variable, if you want, corresponds to the slower speed, which is certainly the case for Einstein Euler. You know, the, the fluid is, the, is uh, the slower of the two speeds, slower compared to the gravity. <clears throat> Uh, I've already highlighted this, but I'll say it again. You know, it's a big open problem. Understand the shock development problem. Locally solving past the, the first singularity for um, uh, relativistic Euler. Um, and again, understanding the long time behavior of solutions with shocks, at least in a perturbative regime. So this is a problem that I believe might be accessible in our academic lifetime. A uh, much harder problem is understanding the long time behavior of, of, the, of the vorticity. You know what? Uh, you know, in some general sense, you know, already a very difficult problem in um, uh, incompressible fluid mechanics, and certainly the situation cannot be uh, any simpler in uh, the uh, compressible case. And then, if you really want to dream, um, there are plenty of physical systems where the geometry is much complicated compared to relativistic or Einstein Euler. So <clears throat> interesting examples include elasticity, crystal optics, nonlinear electromagnetism. And here are the basic equations, you know, at the, the basic equations uh, take the following form. 
And what you see is that the, the principal coefficients have four indices. So whatever this is, this is not Lorentzian geometry. And so the basic geometric scaffolding that one would like to uh, have at one's fingertips in order to think about the problem, the basic geometric scaffolding has not been developed. So to, to make any serious progress on these kinds of problems, at least in the, in the spirit of the way things have been done for Euler, this would require the development of a, a brand new geomet geometry that's able to accommodate these uh, tensors with four indices and, uh, and, their, and their characteristics. And you know, <laughs> one thing that quickly becomes apparent is that if you want to uh, you know, make progress in this realm, you will have to learn something about algebraic geometry because at the end of the day, the characteristics are level sets of polynomials, at least at the level of the cotangent or tangent space picture. And um, you know, if you're asking yourself, what are the structure of the characteristics, then you're asking yourself, what is the structure of the level sets of these polynomials? And uh, very quickly, things can become complicated and singular, uh, but nonetheless, one can dream. Okay, so I am gonna stop there so as to leave a few minutes for questions. Well, thanks a lot for this uh, very uh, impressive talk. Um, uh, let me mention that you would have had similarly exciting topics available to speak if it had been not about matter. So this is even more uh, impressive uh, to oh, see. That's very, that's very kind of you to, say to that. see to see that. So I really enjoyed this talk a lot. I'm sure there are questions. Um, so that we have time for two quick questions, maybe. Yeah, please, anyone. Can you do initial boundary value problems? It's a great open, you know, I, I believe, yes, but um, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, to push those details forward, I think is a great problem. Okay. I haven't thought about the technical details and I, I absolutely would support uh, uh, anyone who wants to work on that. I, you know, I think it's a great problem. Thanks for that question. Other questions, please go ahead. So, if you put all the second order terms on the, uh, to the left, how do the characteristics change? Um, <clears throat> so let me go back to the equations. Let me start with the first order formulation. Yeah. If you start with the first order, if you start with the first order formulation, compute the characteristic subsets of this quasi linear uh, uh, hyperbolic problem, you will find that the characteristics are of two distinct types. There's the uh, uh, sound cones, and the, at least in the tangent space picture, there's the sound cones, and there's the direction of forward velocity propagation. Those characteristics are you know, invariant. They have nothing to do with your formula formulation of the equations. What this uh, formulation of the equations does for you is it simply makes them apparent. You, know, you can sort of read off immediately that the characteristics are this, you know, wave op this uh, course, the characteristics correspond to this metric and the transport operator. So there's no, I mean, the characteristics are, uh, are fixed from the first order point of view. And this is just a way of making them more transparent, but making them more manifest. And B, they should have an influence on the characteristics. They did not have an influence on the characteristics. So there's, there's, this is one of the miracles of Euler. I mean, they, they of course, uh, influence the evolution of the geometry. But for the purposes of, let's say, computing the characteristic subset, they do not factor. So even with C and D, this is an hyperbolic equation? Fundamentally, it's a hyperbolic equation. And you can see that from the usual first order formulation, right? Um, so you, you, can, you can call this as, if you, you can think of this as an auxiliary, uh, an auxiliary system of equations that happens to be satisfied by smooth solutions. It's perhaps best not to think of this as the fundamental uh, Euler equations. This is, let's say the fundamental Euler equations are, are the equations written in uh, first order divergence form. And this is an auxiliary system of equations that certain higher order combinations of the derivatives happen to satisfy. So this is good for um, thinking about a priori estimates, but perhaps it's not the best system for thinking about the fundamental character of the flow. 